One of the things that happens throughout this century is that people are beginning to depend more and more on visual sources. I don't know that many people thought about it a lot, but photographs are coming more and more into their lives. So it became a language that everybody knew they could speak. Photographic images um, changed, I think, changed everybody's understanding about, you know, not only what the world looked like, but what news was. Photography has a certain selective nature that it will take an incident and maybe lift it up out of the ordinary and therefore make bumps in history that you wouldn't find there if it were not for photography. That moment in time when that Spanish uh, uh, Civil War uh, soldier is shot and bends back. Can you ever erase that image from your mind? Can anyone ever say, all right, I saw it, I don't have to see it again, I don't remember? By 1930, people really think that the photograph is the most trustworthy um, source of information. It's the, it's the thing they want most, it's the thing they believe in most. There's no question that most ordinary Americans have been socialized in a way that says that Seeing is believing, and the photograph is the most accurate way to see. And now, the latest miracle of news gathering, sending pictures by wire, has lifted the curtain Washington. on a new era in yes. newspaper history. Yes, leaving Tokyo. The Associated Press, Rockefeller Center, New York City. Each day, thousands of photographs come in from around the world. They arrive via telephone line and satellite link, minutes after they are taken in the field. Kosovo. Continuing. From here, they're selected and distributed to news organizations around the world. If news happens anywhere on Earth, we'll soon see a picture of it. The notion that everyone, or that many people, see the same picture simultaneously is a pure 20th century experience. Never did you have millions of people waking up and seeing the same pictures and seeing the same events pictured. It never happened. News is of today, and it's what happened today. And so the pictures also had to be of what happened today. And if the pictures lag behind the story by any significant amount of time, the story's over and done with. In the 1930s, the daily paper was still the way most Americans got the news. Visionaries at the Associated Press decided that a process must be invented to transmit pictures as quickly as words. The system required a network of high-fidelity telephone lines and would be extremely expensive. Newspaper owners, who were being asked to pay the bill, were skeptical. Roy Howard, head of the Scripps Howard newspaper chain, was convinced the whole thing was a big mistake. There aren't enough important pictures taken in the entire world, he said to justify the expense. But on January 1st, 1935, groups of technicians huddled around black machines across the country. The first transmission, a dramatic photo of a plane crash. The still wet print was wrapped around the cylinder. The rotating drum converted the photograph's black and white tones into a wavering high-pitched sound. In 25 cities across the country, 25 cylinders were rotating simultaneously while recording the image on a photographic plate. And the day after the first wire photo was sent was the opening of the Lindbergh murder-kidnap trial, uh, Bruno Hauptmann going on trial in New Jersey. That story uh, pretty much sealed uh, uh, the success of the wire photo because it became clear that, yes, there were a lot of interesting pictures out there. In the following months, sensational news pictures flew back and forth across the country. 
Amelia Earhart landing in California after flying non-stop from Honolulu. G-Men shooting Ma Barker in a furious gunfight in Florida. Will Rogers, the folksy philosopher, killed in an airplane crash in Alaska. From this time on, big events, no matter where in the world they occurred, would be pictured on the front page of everyone's newspaper on the same day. The whole advent of wire journalism, both stories and pictures, tended to make the U.S. more, more of a one community as opposed to a more regionalized nation, which it was at that time. In 1937, the entire country was riveted by a huge news story, a story that Americans could witness almost instantly because of wire photo. Murray Becker, who was our chief photographer, happened to be out at uh, Lakehurst when this Hindenburg was coming in, and uh, most photographers waited in, in the waiting room because the Hindenburg had been in before, and it was just another picture of the Hindenburg coming down, and we had plenty of pictures, but anyway, he decided to put up the camera as it was coming in. Just as he held up the camera, it exploded, and he hit the trigger, and he had the first puff of explosion on the Hindenburg. Murray Becker was using a speed graphic. Now a speed graphic is a large camera that's held with two hands and the way it operates is this. You put a holder in to the camera full of film, you take out a slide that exposes the film to the shutter, you put the slide on the back of the camera, you cock the shutter and you make the picture. Now you have to take the slide back out, you have to put it in the holder, you take out the holder, you turn the holder over because there's a the film on the other side, you put it in the camera, you pull the slide, you put it in the back, you cock the shutter, and you make the picture. The Hindenburg burned in 47 seconds, and Murray did that three times. So there was this incident of explosion which Murray photographed, and then as the Hindenburg burned in those few seconds, he made two more pictures. A remarkable piece of camera work. The day that Hindenburg went down, the image eclipsed the words. From then on, it wasn't really news if you didn't have a picture. As much as you want to see pictures about nice things, people want to see pictures of horrible things. People want to see the explosion, people want to see the murder, people want to see the carnage, people want to see death, people want to see all the things in pictures that are too scary in life to deal with. And that's one of the things that makes it so impossible to understand the importance of photography because you, it lets you see everything and lets you think about everything. On November 23, 1936, a new magazine appeared on the newsstands. Publisher Henry Luce gave Americans something they had never seen before, a glossy, large-format news magazine which used photographs to tell its stories. Never one to think small, Luce called the magazine, quite simply, Life. It was the biggest mass market hit in the history of publishing. Going back to Gutenberg, nothing that ever had been published 
was a, as big an immediate sellout. And it just, it just took over. Why? Because it spoke in a language that everybody could understand. Pictures. It is very hard. I mean, we're so inundated with images now that it is almost impossible to comprehend how little of that existed when, when life came out. There may be, be a picture on the front page of the newspaper. A few magazines would run pictures. Nothing arrived in your home and opened up the world to you. This is precisely what life did. The success of life, the impact it had, I'm sure surprised the absolute hell out of the people who launched it. I mean, I think Luce knew he was on to something. Henry Luce always had a fascination with what he called picture magic. To introduce his new magazine to the world, he wrote an essay which described the many powers of photography. To see life, to see the world, to watch the faces of the poor and the gestures of the proud to see strange things, machines, armies, multitudes, and shadows in the jungle. To see and take pleasure in seeing. To see and be instructed. To see and be amazed. You turn the pages of Life magazine and there's politics and there's fashion and there's movies and there's advertising and there's cars and there's food and there's homes and there's tragedy, and there's happiness. And if you think about what that was like in 1936, during the Depression, as people are just trying to understand what's going on in this country, it's amazing. Life perfected the format of the photo essay. The photographs, selected and arranged on the page, would tell the story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. When you're finished with that photo essay, you should pretty much know what that story is all about without he even having read a word in a text piece or a caption. There was the career girl, Leonard McCombs' career girl. People hadn't seen stories like that, actually published pictures of people's ordinary lives. One of the reasons I think that, that people get hooked on life is the sense that they are bringing these extraordinary images to any American citizen. Any given American, and, and no matter where he or she lived, no matter what their class was, no matter what they did for a living, they all could essentially share in this experience. And that experience, of course, is defined by still photographs. Life told us about a world that many of us didn't have. I grew up in, in, in the Italian section of Brooklyn. I, I, I did not speak English until I went to school. A magazine, like Life magazine, which somehow came into this Italian household. I don't know why, but I guess someone said, I think we should learn how to be Americans. And Life magazine was this great, great lesson about what the other world, the outside world was all about. You know, it's so amazing. I can't remember what I ate this afternoon. I can remember what I saw in Life magazine. In a special feature, Life printed snapshots of Marion Chadwick and her father at the beach. One photograph a year, for over a quarter of a century. Great Depression. In Washington, Roosevelt attempted to deal with the economic crisis, proposing a multitude of new government programs. He knew he would need the support of Congress and the general public. 
As part of the Farm Security Administration, the government established an organization unique in peacetime, a propaganda agency that would use the power of photographs to sell Roosevelt's programs. Roy Stryker, an economist from Columbia University, was chosen to run this new agency. Roy Stryker never took a picture in his life, but he was a great talent scout. And he brought together a team of photographers, some of whom have become legends in the history of photography, like Dorothea Lang, Arthur Rothstein, and Russell Lee, and Walker Evans. Stryker was dedicated to telling the story of America the way it was. As he put it, uh, our job was to introduce America to Americans. And through our mighty nation, it left a dreadful track. From Oklahoma City to the Arizona line, Dakota and Nebraska to the lazy Rio Grande, it fell across our city. I think what I photographs that I did for farm security and what we all did, I think, uh, is an expression of our feeling that we were living in a great country, but that the country was in great trouble. And also that the people who were most troubled in those times were also the people who were part of its greatness. It was a politically naive period. And all of us who went to Washington at that time had some crazy idea that what we could do could alter the course of history. I've read any number of times about how there was dust in the food and dust on the table and dust in the bed and in the clothes. But until you actually see a good photograph such as Arthur Rothstein's of the uh, people walking from the house to the dust cellar, you don't get a sense of the immensity of the occurrence. Somehow the photograph sums this all up in a different way. You get a a sense of it that's uh, sort of visceral instead of just intellectual. Over six years, FSA photographers took a quarter of a million photographs. They were made available free of charge and were widely used in newspapers, magazines, exhibits, and books. At the time, the pictures helped sell Roosevelt's programs. But for later generations, they have become a national treasure. Frozen in this archive is a critical moment of American history. Today, when we think of the Depression, we see these faces, the suffering and the sadness, as well as their implicit message. As bad as things were, America would endure. In the early 1940s, a young photographer, Gordon Parks, got a call to come to Washington. With the success of the FSA, its role was being expanded. Roy Stryker believed that photographs could be used to combat racial discrimination. He began by showing Parks how things really worked on the streets of the nation's capital. So Roy Stryker asked me a few questions and said, what do you, you know, really know about the city? And I told him, he said, hmm. He says, well, I'm going to give you an assignment. Your first assignment, put your camera on the shelf. I want you to go to Julius Garfinkel's store, buy yourself a top coat. There's a restaurant directly across the street, and then there's a motion picture house down the, in the same block. So to make the story short, each one of them gave me short shrift. I, uh, I didn't get a coat at, at the department store. When I went to the restaurant, a man said, don't you know Negroes have to eat in the on the other side, the back. You can't come in this side. You have to get your food in the back. And of course, I didn't even get in the movie house. That's the way it was. So I was astounded. And I went back, and Roy saw me walk in, and he smiled. He said, well, how did it go? <laughs> I said, well, I think you know how it went. He said, yeah, what are you going to do about it? I said, I don't know. What do I do about it? He said, well, what'd you bring your camera down here for? Just like that. I said, oh. So he left, and the only person left 
in the building was a black woman, a charwoman, who was sweeping the floor and mopping. So I introduced myself. She told me her name was Ella Watson. And I asked her if I could photograph her. Photograph me like this? I said, yes. I had really thought of Grant Wood's picture of the American Gothic. I put a broom in one hand and a mop in the other and told her to look directly into the camera. Well, that picture has become the best known picture of all of my work. I showed it to Stryker three mornings later. He said, well, you're getting the idea, but you're going to get us all fired. <laughs> said, this is a government agency, and that picture is an indictment against America. And I realized uh, from the reaction of people that the camera could be a, a, a very powerful instrument against discrimination, against poverty, against racism. filled with this idea of photography, of natural spaces, being very much linked with um, an American vision. The landscape in America has a, has a great um, history and legacy to it. Um, it was our cathedrals, um, it was our castles. Um, in response to a European idea of what art should be about, something spiritual, something lofty, something historical. Our history was in our waterfalls and our mountains and our great rivers. People, I think, misunderstand uh, Adams because he photographed mountains and people, so people think it's about uh, geography or geology. But he really was photographing the weather. He, uh, he made pictures unlike anybody else had made, or for that matter, has made. When Adams was doing his best work, everyone thought it was irrelevant. Beautiful pictures of little uh, pristine little lakes in the high Sierras. What did that mean during the, uh, during the Great Depression, during the, uh, during the Second War? It really seemed like escapism then. Hmm? Uh, later, after the world became uh, concerned with ecological issues, and when it began to seem to people that the preservation of our place was as important, as central uh, an issue as, as any, then Adams uh, began to seem very relevant, hmm? very prophetic. In the early 1940s, the photograph had completed its conquest of America. After the success of life, the newsstands were overflowing with picture magazines. Wire services were now sending pictures instantly around the world, not only on telephone lines, but via radio waves. 35 millimeter cameras and fast lenses made it possible to capture life in action. With these technical innovations, photography had immense power to shape public opinion. All this potential came together on December 7th, 1941. The war would be fought on many fronts, an astounding global story which both the military and the press were determined to record in pictures. Life magazine and former FSA photographers were rushed to the front lines. It soon became a tragedy of unimaginable proportions. But ironically, World War II was a photographer's dream. Military cameramen moved in, as always, with the troops to bring home the pictured facts. The hell of jungle warfare, the dawn of landing day on some coral beach.
Public opinion wins wars, wrote General Eisenhower. The double face of Nippon showed itself in its truth. To win World War II, it wasn't enough to tell the American public what they were fighting for. It was necessary to drive home what they were fighting against. The Japanese, with their unprovoked attack on Pearl Harbor, were singled out as objects of particular hatred. Well, the Japanese soon became Japs, not just in life, but uh, in, the, in the press in general. Um, the worst, the most tragic thing that happened was the, uh, the evacuation of what eventually became about 100,000 Japanese American residents of the West Coast to the in interior. There was racism, both conscious and unconscious, in the treatment of, of the Japanese. If you can understand that, then you can understand the dimension of the war that seldom surfaces today, the kind of intense hatred that was necessary to fight it. To modern eyes, of all the many pictures coming out of World War II, this is one of the strangest and most telling. Life magazine printed it as their picture of the week with the following caption. When he said goodbye to Natalie Nickerson, her handsome Navy lieutenant promised her a Jap. She was his girlfriend, apparently, and a very respectable girl who went to church and uh, led her high school class and that sort of thing. And here she was <laughs> present at this bizarre and gruesome exhibit of this Japanese soldier's skull. Well, that sort of thing is commonplace. And so it became a real service problem is what to do with these, these cleansed bones of former Japanese soldiers that were being sent home as gifts and souvenirs. But my point is that it's never happened with the German corpses. They were never boiled down to get their bones to send home, never. The Germans were white people. And I think this ought to be talked about in exactly those terms because it's been forgotten. <clears throat> we didn't lock up people with German names. We locked up people with Japanese names, although they were American citizens. They were very close to, it seemed, to what used to be called niggers in this country, and that should never be forgotten either. And the fact that they were not white suggested a very special brand of alien uh, offensiveness. And consequently, to... to uh, take the flesh off their dead bones and then mail those bones home as nice souvenirs for the people in Iowa and so on. Didn't bother people at all. They thought it quite appropriate. You can learn a lot about Americans in the Second World War from that one photograph, I would say. World War II produced many famous photographs, but one of the most famous was not of guns or tanks, but of a young woman's back. Her name was Betty Grable, and at the height of the war, 50,000 servicemen a month were asking for this picture. 20th Century Fox made a movie to capitalize on the fame of the photograph. They called it Pinup Girl. With high heels, her bathing suit, and her big come hither smile, Betty Grable's photograph was everywhere. A fighter plane was named Pinup Girl and had her picture painted on its fuselage. She built herself as the daughter of a truck driver and took her role as icon seriously. I've got to be an enlisted man's girl, she said. Just like this has got to be an enlisted man's war. Like a fireside at home, do I love my pinup girl? The war created a fad for pinups of all kinds, on barrack walls, in decals, in soldiers' wallets. Life magazine published a set of pictures of beautiful women and then conducted a poll among the troops. Which one of these girls would you most like to have pneumonia with? The girl you'd most like to bail out with? The girl you'd most like to take out for a chicken dinner? An army publication put it simply, we're not only fighting for the four freedoms, we're fighting for the priceless privilege of making love to American women. So baby, keep a grinning, remember my hopes on you. This is the day for which free people long have waited. This is D-Day. For years it had been in the planning, 
the return of Allied forces to France, the ultimate crushing of Germany, and the end of the war in Europe. Every magazine and newspaper editor in the country knew that D-Day would be their biggest story. Life magazine sent John Morris to London in late 1943. His instructions were simple. Get us the first pictures of the invasion. By June 1944, I had a team of six war correspondent photographers, and my job was to get them assigned to various spots for the great story of the invasion, which involved a million men. To cover the actual landing, Morris sent Robert Capa. Capa had photographed the Spanish Civil War, the desert battle across North Africa, and the invasion of Italy. If anyone could capture the events of D-Day on film, it would be Robert Capa. Kappa's film came in, we were desperate because we had to make a, a final deadline of 9 a.m. Th uh, Thursday morning for shipment to, to life. Up until that moment, the whole world had, uh, didn't know what D-Day actually looked like. So it, we, were, uh, we were really pressed for time. Kappa's film came, uh, in, uh, came to me in the early evening with a note from him saying, John, the action is all in these four rolls of 35 millimeter film. And I ordered the darkroom to rush processing as fast as possible. I said, give me contact prints. I needed to edit. And the young lad in the darkroom uh, put the film in a drying cabinet and closed the doors and there was too much heat. And because I, we were in such a hurry, the films were, were ruined and on three rolls of the four, there was no image discernible at all, but on the fourth roll, fortunately, I found 11 frames that could be printed. And those are the pictures that will live forever. One of the great photo icons of all time, possibly the greatest, is a picture that Joe Rosenthal made of the flag raising on Iwo Jima, on top of Mount Suribachi. It had been a bloody, bloody course, and then along comes this picture that says victory. The night it was made was flown to Guam, and the next day it was transmitted to the U.S. So it was in the U.S. within a day and a half of the time it was made and transmitted to newspapers. And the picture was played on the front pages everywhere, and it became an instant icon. That photograph is especially interesting, I think, because it could be said to mark the impact of the New Deal upon the way we understood the war. We understood the war as an almost magical force for uniting people in this country and for effacing differences, and that is what that photograph, taken just as a piece of symbolism, is about. One picture, and in that brief moment, Rosenthal's camera seemed to capture the soul of a nation.
There are certain pictures that change our lives. Now, I don't mean pictures of events that change our lives, but I mean pictures themselves that change our lives. And the Auschwitz and other concentration camp photos are in that category. People had read descriptions of the concentration camps, but they seemed exaggerated, unbelievable. Eyewitnesses had been met with suspicion. The possibility that a whole people had been exterminated was unthinkable. And then, in these images, visual proof of the enormity of the Nazi crimes. Even Margaret Burke White, the experienced combat photographer, could not fathom what she was seeing. Using the camera was almost a relief, she wrote. It interposed a slight barrier between myself and the white horror in front of me. I kept telling myself that I'd believe it when I had a chance to look at my own photographs. But later, when I developed the negatives, I could not bring myself to look at the films. Like the Holocaust they documented, the photographs mark a turning point in human consciousness. The world would never be the same. On January 24, 1955, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City presented an exhibition called The Family of Man. Organized by photographer Edward Steichen, it was a fusion of carefully selected photographs and captions, all to support the concept, Mankind is One. It included 500 photographs from 68 countries around the world. It featured groups of related pictures that moved the viewer from images of lovers meeting to pictures of marriage, to birth, and finally to universal concerns of food and shelter. For one thing, it came after this terrible war and the, the aftermath of the war in which uh, uh, societies were uh, really disrupted. It made the point that People everywhere had the same needs, the same desires, that families were families wherever they existed, no matter what their surroundings looked like. It appealed to people on a just very human level. Critics attack the show as simplistic, but for the vast general public, the exhibit was a profound revelation. It toured the country and then the world, bringing many people into museums for the first time in their lives. A book was published based on the exhibit, and it brought the pictures to millions more. In all, The Family of Man became the most widely seen collection of images in the history of photography. I don't remember when the family of man came into my consciousness, uh, but its effect on me was extraordinary. It was a collection of the single most powerful images that I had ever seen, certainly to that date, and probably ever have seen together. These extraordinary pictures celebrated a humanism, a saying that all people were alike under the skin, but yet in their differences they expressed the beauty of what it is to be human. The couple making love, obviously in the middle of sex, 
although all you see are the shoulders, was what I hoped passion would be. The father teaching the son how to hunt in Bekuana land was something about fatherhood, something about what I wanted to be as a father. But then there were photographs that just to me said, said things that were so big about the world. I mean, the, the Cartier-Bresson photographs, of the, especially the one of the women looking off, off across the field of stones in Kashmir. The Doisino picture of the lovers by the Seine. They were icons. They stood for meaning that kept building and building and building. And it told us that the human heart was beautiful. And the human heart was shared by everyone who was human. And years ago, I watched uh, my wife going through the, the, the New York Times uh, magazine section, and she was turning like this really fast, really fast. And she finally stopped at what I thought was the worst ad I've ever seen. The headline was just dismal. It said nothing. Uh, the layout was really bad. And I said, why did you stop at that ad? And she said, I like that dress. Very nice picture of a dress. I like the dress. I think that our sense of our clothing at all times is essentially pictorial. Groups of people in 1863, caught by the camera, show these, these people looking like bundles of laundry. I think in order to look better in the camera eye, a kind of self-contained slim unit has come into existence. You have to really be quite slender to be perfect in the camera. What the camera influences right there is the way people wish to look. After the war, going through the pages of Vogue or Harper's Bazaar, looking at Penn's photographs, later at Avedon's photographs, what these photographs did was create a way we wanted to look. It permeated all aspects of um, ourselves, certainly ourselves as women in the world. And you had desirable uh, people's looks seen through the camera in those clothes that looked marvelous under the camera eye. There is no, nothing the camera cannot make marvelous. Let's say it's a dress. You put it on the model and it's still, it's okay, but it's a dress. And then somebody pins it up in the back and pins it up on the side and it's still a dress. And then a photographer, an Avedon, uh, takes a photograph and it's something that everyone wants. It's this beautiful, incredible dress. And then what happens is they go to the store, but it never looks like the photograph. Nothing really ever looks like the photograph and that's the sad part of life. Setting up the family slide projector is a ritual that's virtually disappeared, but it's one that I recall with great clarity and affection from my childhood. While my father's sophisticated knowledge of photography made our family somewhat unique, in many other ways, we were typical. We loved making photographs of the markers of life. Often these pictures were made on family vacations when we, like millions of other Americans, stuffed the family into the station wagon and headed out onto the open road. One might have the impression of looking at scores of these pictures that we moved around in a kind of clump, never more than perhaps an arm's length apart. I think the pictures represent a kind of tenacity on the part of my parents to maintain a kind of ideal image or ideal appearance of family closeness in spite of whatever battles might have been going on in the back seat of the car two minutes before the photographs were made.
one of the most interesting things that in a sense plays itself out in these pictures is the idea of connecting the older mythologies of American culture to what you might think of as the future mythologies of American culture, especially with the growing mythology of the ideal family in America in the 50s. In the boom of the 1950s, Americans were being inundated with images. Although television was becoming America's favorite pastime, photography was still king. Magazines were everywhere. Life and look had more readers than ever. The pictures in both the ads and the stories showed a brave new world of suburbs, cake mixes, Polaroid cameras, crinolines, and cars with fins. Life magazine, movies, and soon television create a photographic world of possibilities that nobody could have dreamed of 20 years earlier. And all of a sudden you start to get, after the war, a different kind of visual universe that that magazine says it's reporting on, but it's creating, it's helping create it. At the time, people believed in it so strongly that people getting Life magazine, looking at pictures of those families, would go through, oh, may, that, you know, maybe we should redecorate our living room like that, or what can we do to look more like this family? The vision of America and the, the vision of the good life that's presented in magazines like Life and Look um, is extremely narrow, extremely circumscribed in terms of who's being uh, pictured. It's clearly middle class. It's clearly white. It clearly has a husband and wife who accept that, that the man is out in the public world, the wife is home, she's a mother, she's taking care of the whole domestic sphere. A very clear, narrow, uh, tightly defined vision of, of, of what it is to be normal. We could look back at the 50s and say, God, those ads really distort. And how could people have wanted to feel like the people in those ads? But today, we'll have something like a Calvin Klein ad. All right, now we have the sexy mother who looks beautiful with the children on the beach, which I can tell you had never has happened. And we look at that and we say, that's true. And I want to have a white sweater like that while I'm on the beach with my children. And everything stays white and the waves come up and we all look relaxed together. And nobody's asking me for lemonade or where the juice pack is. Get happy, say she cares away. The iconography of the, the 1950s, the official iconography, of course, has become, you know, the, the largest cliché of the latter half of the 20th century, that uh, everything really, really domesticated, you know, absolutely everything under control, conformity, blah, blah, blah. Things weren't actually that way out in the streets. mid-1950s, a new generation of photographers, led by Robert Frank and William Klein, rejected the perfect lighting and composition of professional picture-taking. William Klein described his excitement in first seeing not the order, but the chaos of life, while looking through his viewfinder. I rushed out into the street, he said, and shot away, aiming, not aiming, it didn't matter. I wanted it all in a gluttonous rage. Gone was the comfortable, middle-class world. Gone was the neat magazine photo essay with its beginning and middle and end. This photography is about this mess of misconnections and people uncertain of where they're going and, uh, and people colliding and cultures colliding and people not seeing each other. It represents this very, very different development in photography and um, there's sort of no turning back from that. These photographers said, here's your world. This is, this is your world. This is not the fantasy of it. This is, this is the real world. 
and made pictures that were graphic and iconic and could both tell the truth about what was what they were seeing and stand for something big the best photographers showed that in this vast country there are many lost souls that not everybody fits in and that the one american dream is not a one size fits all In August 1955, a 14-year-old boy visiting Mississippi from Chicago was accused of whistling at a white woman. He was bludgeoned to death and his body was thrown into a nearby river. In a South where violent racism was commonplace, Emmett Till's murder may have gone unnoticed, except for this photograph. Published only in the black press, it showed his young face beaten beyond recognition. It was um, awful, awful, awful. It was horrific. He looked like an old man. I would go to bed every night, frightened to death, literally frightened we to death, scared. because we were the same age as he, and we didn't know whether or not they would come and get us. And we also not. saw pictures in the newspapers, of, and especially of, in, the, in the Chicago Defendant Pittsburgh Courier, of the, the uh, assailants uh, in, the classroom, in the courtroom laughing. Mm -hmm. A picture's worth a thousand words. They're seared in your brain. Yeah, and, and they remain there. And Emmett Till's face is still in my mind today. I can see it. It's there, and it, it will never leave. I think my generation of black Southerners who became active in the Civil Rights Movement in the late 50s, early 60s was the Emmett Till generation because down to the person, all my friends saw that picture about the same age as I, or a year or two older, and they were enraged and power, felt powerless at the same time and vowed, as I did, that one day they were going to get even. They were going to do something about it. Photography was growing up with a century. In the coming years, it would confront the television age and soon the digital age. Every aspect of American life was about to go through profound changes. The camera would be there to document, to shock, to motivate, and to transform.